Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, very warm welcome to the East Richard Town Council Public Services Committee uh, on Thursday, the 30th of November. Very, very warm welcome. Glad it's warm in here. Thank you, Town Clerk. It's and it's good it is outside. Very, very cozy in here. So we've got a, we've got a, a very busy meeting. So um, special welcome uh, this evening uh, to uh, Sergeant Doug Johnson from Sussex Police. Uh, Mr. Mr. James Lau, who's the Chief Executive of Queen Victoria Hospital. You're very, you're very welcome, sir. Um, Mike Barlow and Mike Brooks from East Grinstead Food Bank. Um, very, very welcome. Uh, Penny Ford and Karen Salis from the Integrated Care Board, who are on uh, Zoom. I think they've... Well, Karen was still waiting Karen, for okay. Penny. Yeah. Thank you. And we are also expecting Dr. Minesh Patel from Moatfield Surgery and Dr. Deborah Allen from Moatfield Surgery as well uh, as, as guests to join us. And they're, they're all sitting here. So um, we are we are recording um, and um, the recording will be on Town Council YouTube in, in two, three days uh, time. First item on the agenda is public participation. Uh, I think we have a couple of members of the public in here tonight. Thank you. Um, would anybody like to ask a question or questions in this section? Frank? Okay. Would you like to stand and state who you are? Okay. Thank you. Um, Frank Gary, just a very quick one. Um, could the police please give an update on the video opening of the police minister contact point? Okay. Uh, we would, that police matters are being covered in the formal agenda, uh, 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 Sergeant Johnson. So if you could cover mm -hmm. that particular point. When you, when you do your report and, and in queue, so that's all right. If there's anything else, any other further questions? No, thank you. Okay, so move on to apologies for absence, um, please, Town Clerk. Um, apologies from Councillor DeBell and Councillor Scott. Councillor Farron is substituting for Councillor Scott. That does need to be approved. Okay, thank you. Uh, so can we vote to accept those apologies, please? Can I have a second? Mm -hmm. Thank you, all those in favour. Thank you very much. Thank you. And to, to yeah. and yeah. substitution for the leader of the council. You are very welcome, leader of the town council. Can you vote on that as well, for council for a substitution? Thank That's you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, to, uh, agenda item two is to receive the minutes of the previous meeting held on the seventh of September two thousand and twenty-three. These are for accuracy. Are there any? I'd like to propose those minutes. Can I have a second? I'll second those. Are yes. there any points that uh, members of the committee wish to raise? If not, can I have a vote in favour of those minutes then, please? Thank you very much. Just sign those. Yeah. I thought they had the door. Thank Can you. Yes, Manesh. Oh. Hello. Yes, please. We haven't seen Manesh yet. Um, yeah, Hi, Dr. Allen. Deborah Allen. Deborah Allen. Hello, it's Rexy. You've got to take a seat. We literally just started, so good timing. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to Deborah Allen, Dr. Allen. Oh, yeah, Deborah Allen, like to, uh, yeah. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. Okay, agenda item three is to receive uh, chairman's update. So I've got a few that uh, thank you, Town Clerk, for preparing the brief. Um, there's a few items that hopefully you can all hear me, but some important items. Um, in terms of uh, pharmacies, which was on the agenda for the previous two meetings in June and September. Um, obviously, we've had the amalgamation and sale of some of the ex Lloyd's pharmacies. Um, uh, the one at Moatfield Surgery has now gone, I think, gone independent, and that happened in September. Um, uh, and the boots in uh, Waitrose closed and they're now amalgamated with uh, the boots in the High Street. And the Day Lewis um, pharmacy in Felbridge, uh, interestingly, I think the, the lead. Pharma, pharmacological lead moved from what was the Lloyd's Moatfield mm -hmm. Surgery to Day-Lewis, which was Mary. 
yeah, and um, so she's now at Day Lewis. And interestingly, um, I think they've just installed a brand new sort of dispensing machine, which is like a double height mm -hmm. cash machine, which it looks a very impressive piece of kit to me. I haven't seen it in operation, but I assume mm -hmm. it's operational to dispense drugs and prescriptions and, and various other things. So it looks a, looks a really good uh, piece of investment. So um, I noticed that the other day. In terms of road resurfacing and white lining, Turners Hill Road has now been relined, uh, but the gangs from West Sussex are working at least uh, 13 weeks behind the resurfacing work at this time. The jet patching machine have now been retired for the winter because they, they only work in uh, fairly, fairly good um, uh, temperatures, but we'll be back in the spring. Um, very, very pleased to report that Heathcote Drive was extensively patched uh, by the jet patching machine uh, and have done a very, very good job. Um, so thanks to Councillor Gibson, who I know um, uh, uh, assisted greatly with our West Sussex County Council colleagues, and hopefully that is still down for resurfacing in, in the new year. Um, our District Council Parks and Open Spaces contract, as reported at the last meeting, the District Council have ended the contract for landscaping and graffiti removal from the Town Council Councils, not just us, but Haywards Heath and Burgess Hill, from April next year. We will look to talk with the new contractors as to any potential to pick up work, but note that this is a poor time as it, it cannot be guaranteed regarding the budget discussions currently ongoing, as it could be a minimum of six months before any offers are made. In terms of rail ticket offices, this town council lobbied strongly in the consultation process, so we are thrilled to see the result of the consultation meant that the decisions to close ticket offices were now abandoned. Uh, CCTV, um, there are concerns as to the CCTV in town. The transmissions costs have increased significantly due to the contract expiring with Chroma Vision, which Mid Sussex District Council as the lead authority are trying to replace. A meeting has been promised to fully brief the town councils regarding this. In the meantime, the CCTV is working, but it is costing more to run. This will have a budgetary implication but they are not yet fully understood. It is also under discussion as to the monitoring of the CCTV, which we are led to understand is changing. Uh, further discussion with Mid-Sussex District Council will be reported back. In terms of Gatwick Airport and its station, a bigger station with a new second concourse and airport entrance has been delivered at Gatwick, doubling the space available to the millions of passengers that use the station each year. Eight new escalators and five new lifts will provide a step change for accessibility. The new lifts and escalators along with four new stairways and widened platforms will help passengers move between the train station and the airport more quickly and easily. In terms of defibrillators situated around the town, Steve Morris, who many of you will know, who started the project for the defibrillators to be placed around the town and has since acted as their guardian, checking batteries and pads regularly and informing council as to whether they needed replacing, has advised uh, this council that he intends to give up this role. The council are not the owners of the defibrillators, there are about 15 in the town, but some are cited at the schools which look after them directly. The council makes sure that the ones placed in the station, library, high street, Checkermead and East Court are all kept in working order. Steve is advertising to see if someone wishes to take over his voluntary role. If he is unsuccessful, this will fall to the council. This will then effectively make us responsible for the defibrillators and we will need to register them under our insurance. Committee at the time that they were put in were concerned about taking this responsibility. However, a small budget each year ensures that they remain in working order. It is likely that the council will become responsible for them and therefore we have to devote officer time to checking defibrillators monthly. In terms of winter maintenance, and uh, it's fairly relevant now, uh, or likely to come up, the County Council have advised that they have topped up to 75% all of the town's grit bins. On the inspection late October recently, it was noted that at least three bins were 25%, and these have been reported back to the County Council to ask if they were missed or whether they have been subsequently emptied by the public. They will be topped up to 75% by the Town Council staff. Um, in the event of inclement weather, West Sussex County Council grit roads in advance and clear snow from the A22, 264 and bus routes, where this is possible to access 
with large machinery. There are 67 town council supplied salt bins placed around the town for public use. However, they are only use for highways, not for private drives. And once emptied will only be refilled if the town council have the stocks to do so. And once the winter management plan of the High Street, London Road and East Court have been attended to. The town council do not grip the footpaths to the schools. It is simply not possible with the resources currently available. In the event of snowfall, all available staff assist with the clearance of East Court to allow the booked events to continue while the outside team attend the town centre pavements and Mount Noddy Cemetery. Only once these areas are clear and safe to traverse can the team consider looking at refilling salt bins. There is enough salt to refill 50% of the 67 bins. A bin on Imberhorn Lane was removed this year following noting that it had not been used for several years. The Amenities and Tourism Committee deal with the winter maintenance plan and provision of salt bins. However, it is at public services and therefore for noting at this committee. Um, so, um, actually that's the end of the updates. I think I've just got one more. Yes. Uh, a couple that come in fairly late. I'd like to thank um, East Grinstead Lions and the PCSO charity for the prostate testing event that was held here on Saturday, the 11th of November recently. Uh, nearly a thousand men came through and were tested, all got their results and hopefully good, but you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good warning sign. Thank you to the town council for facilitating the use of Meridian Hall, another very successful event. Also the ABC um, COVID booster campaign in during October from the rugby club was very successful again, uh, and thanks to the rugby club. And we've recently been approached by Councillor Lorraine Carvalho from Mid Sussex District Council, who is the Armed Forces Champion for the District Council through um, myself and the Royal British Legion uh, to set up uh, an armed, a veterans armed forces um, sort of breakfast club and social yeah. events. So um, that various meetings have taken place already. That initiative is due to start on the 6th of December. And for that, so further details will be disseminated via the town clerk. Um, so uh, that's fairly extensive update. Any questions from members of the council on that? But they will all be in the papers. Thank you, town clerk, again for putting all that together. Gender item four, moving on uh, to receive any members' declarations of interest. Um, if anybody has any new interests, can you make note of them here? Councillor Gibson. Um, I should declare an interest as a member of West Sussex County Council with regard to agenda item 11. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and that's the immunity tip, recycling tip. Thank you very much. Okay, any other declarations? No, thank you. Okay, agenda item five. So we now come on to police matters. So um, we are uh, very pleased uh, this evening that uh, into, the, into the hot seat. Uh, it's uh, Sergeant Johnson, thank you, and I understand it is, you've actually come in, you're not on duty technically, but it's kind of your, your day's leave, so a double thanks to you for that. So um, probably the first time you, you've, you've come to the Town Council, I would say for our guests that this Town Council historically has had a very close working relationship with Sussex Police for years and decades through the Town Clerk, you're clearly our, our, our sort of Chief Officer and regularly attended these sort of forums. Um, th there are some issues that I know that the town clerk has, has advised Sussex Police of, and members will be aware. So if I could just pass over to you, Sergeant Johnson, first of all, um, just to give a sort of a summary from your situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can you join me? Stand up, please. No, you, you please do whatever you uh, feel you want to do. Who asked the question? Discuss many matters of public about the disposal that will make it less 
inviting, I guess, the best way to use and what we can do is that's more of a joint matter that we need to work forward in regards to how much money we can spend on it and what we can do about that. Uh, the children aspect of the ASV, as we were discussing earlier, we've always had children coming in and out. I know the, there was an issue with kids on the hospital roof, which I believe only lasts a week or two maximum, which is through the summer period. They've moved on from that because they're still trying to have a bloody thing to do. Uh, we've been raised, there's always issues around the um, King's Visitor Centre. So we do focus on it as much as we can. We've got the skate park in front of the um, or the general district. As well as the outside, you should have a piece of soda come up and ask for Monday. I've seen the photographs of some chairs surrounding a bin where I think some kids potentially stole these chairs and sat around a bin drinking or something like that. But that again, I think they've been cleared out. We can double check with that and find out for yourselves. Um, <coughs> parks, boy races. We just we just had a um, drink about operation. We do again have a sort of up cruise, which is normally on Thursday evening, which would be Thursday night. So where they have businesses dedicated to boy races, we normally meet up for peace parties to go down and take um the A23 down to Brighton and all that, so we are aware of all that. Uh, scooters, um, mm -hmm. I know it's been a massive issue to out of this. Mm -hmm. I think people believe that we have a short flag, but the blocks are a lot, lot longer than they've done. Uh, that again, I couldn't make any personal comment on that. That's going to go from higher than me of how we should be dealing with that. They should be classed over the of our vehicles, they should have the whole MOT insurance, drugs, license, etc. Um, but I think because of London filing areas, it's made very sort of grey how we should and shouldn't be dealing with it. And you've got children who use them, the adults who use them, and we've got, got different layers and levels of how we treat each one. But again, you know, what can we do? What can we do with that? I think we get a lot of um, not so much <coughs> them out on Facebook, but if we do see a scooter on a child and then post a picture on there, I think we get a lot of backlash for that. So again, we've got to trade like you know, how we deal with it, how best to um, post what we are doing about it. Um, <clears throat> is there anything in particular that we want to know about? Or can, can I just, uh, with, with the check and read police contact point, please, yes. that, that, that building, if you weren't aware, was a joint venture between this town council, that the, the town council owns check and read theatre yes. and the building and the, and the police lease from effectively check and read trust. And that's been open for seven years now. It's a fantastic facility because I was involved in it when it came on online. Yeah. So it, is it actually being operational at the moment for the public, or is it still you know, are detectives still there in the back room on the yeah, IT equipment? Um, yeah, they are. We're good. Probably 10, 12, best behind the yeah. top office. Yeah. Yeah. So you will have police. Um, we, we've got time, okay, we're still in Crawley. That's, that is where the police start from. From there, we have the Crawley normally stay in Crawley, but they do should send at least one of the car across to East Winsted, as in the well, book on East Winsted. From there, there, there is a fluid situation depending on where the grade one, two, three is coming from. So there's more emergencies in Bogus Hill, um, Crawley, Hersey, where they sort of get dragged to jobs. But there is also officers who do work on the streets. So mm. They're not continuously 24 hours a day in there. We, do, we have responsibility 24 hours. We have MBT, which is I am, which are, I think my letter made on Facebook, which is clearly 8 to 11. We start Hersey. We do send two pieces of those across to each winter for the 8 to 5 and the 3 to uh, 11, but we're not anymore. So you do have MBT for most of the day, and they will then be doing with, with the general, um, well, the ASB, the children, the street drinking, uh, the neighbor disputes. So if they're not in the office, they can get parked, walk around, or getting a paid job for them going to. So you might not see someone in the actual police station, but they are based for the day from there to do the work team. Okay. And um, is it Chris Lovelock, who's one of the PCSO? Is he the senior PCSO? I don't know how you... Uh, no, so Mike's the member, Chris Lovelock and Jack Raven Eagle. So they're not, I wouldn't say senior, but they are the East Queens of East Side, so Mike's the most they'll always be there. And then you've got two other sections, which have um, two PCSOs. One will be for the town, and one will be for general villages. So my team is generally town centre, as well as two PCSOs for the town centre. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the, I mean, the t you know, the town clerk has advised you of, of, of the issues. Um, Councillor Hughes, I don't know if you want to come here because you were personally involved. I think you know with with one of the incidents in, in yeah. near, near the King Centre. Would you just like to briefly recount? Yeah, I think um, I think anybody that's been to town in town now has has some experience of of, of or bad behaviour. Um, I've been uh, yelled and screamed at in the street by uh, the drunken crowd. Um, I was also on the town council for Vivo the other Saturday, and it was probably uh, the biggest concern. Mm -hmm. uh, people were talking about the temple is unsafe, we have a lack of free presence, people are being vulnerable. So it's, it, there's a real undercurrent. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to say thank you for providing the, uh, the website detail. And I uh, went on and had a look at the neighborhood needs table, table okay. which is, is really, really informative. Uh, and I've taken quite a lot of information from that to be able to have conversations. I think my take out from looking at uh, the sort of Heron's Eye uh, and Ashes, well, East Greenwood Town and Ash Pad, our main wards, is if I look at the antisocial behavior uh, and violent crime. Uh, while you can't always look high, yeah. but, but, have, but the antisocial behaviour and uh, public orders are just mm -hmm. continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I sort of, it's not new, no, it's every not. town is experiencing it. And I just wondered whether there are any learnings or anything else that we could be sort of testing or trialling in town to try and overcome some of the issues. Okay. One of the points that came from that particular incident or incidents or related incidents was, was I know you've got PCSOs and they're great and, and uh, Chris, I've seen them around a lot and they, they do put themselves about the town, I know that, but their powers of how far they can act before they have to call in yeah. you guys, is, is that an issue now? Um, I think the more, it's not a major issue, but I think that Almost like the, the more that children and so to speak villages learn because of the um, of the internet, they know what power to yeah. have. So they know exactly how much they can push before they're gonna get a police officer turn up. Um, and it's not fair that people are sort of just if they do a really good job, they're always out and about, but they can't arrest people, they can't do the they can't do any more than sort of tell them off, give them a they can only get fined in more disinfection ways, so they can try and disperse them. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they designate the powers which comes from the chief constable, so those can chop and change. So, in rivers, and I say power a lot, other place, whatever they decide to give them as their powers, all they can do. <laughs> um, but nothing stops Chris from calling me or my other people, any PC, and says, Can you come and help us? But then obviously, you've got to wait until that police officer arrives, not really in the town centre. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, as a group said, the children know a lot of what powers they do and do not have. Mm -hmm. And so they push them as far as they can. Mm -hmm. And by the time we get there, so they're probably going to dispose because they can, because they don't want to be tested. There's the, um, the street drinkers. And um, honestly, Jack had what we call a problem solving trial, but he um, designated to dealing with that. And he got all the information, all the, what we call CAD, all the um, clients will call in. So criminal reports, he takes notes of all those, he should be contacting people or speaking to yourselves about what we can do as a joint enterprise. Um, and just try and make that corner not appealing for them basically, but they have because it's a really nice space, centre of town, close to what they need to drink, close to I think one of their homes. And it's quite nice to sit on that lovely bit of concrete yeah. and just um, yeah. sunwalk. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the fear is that we can do it, we can, we can make that corner um, uncharitable to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that was done previously with another area of town, but then we'll just move mm -hmm. in the problem, we'll just move in the problem yes. around mm -hmm. rather than trying to get to. Um, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And I think the other issue is us getting, getting into. I suppose why they're drinking and try and work behind the scenes and try and well, we can't really get them off the drink because if they are an alcoholic, they, you know, yeah. sort of, that's I think, yeah. Again, that's symptomatic of a national issue, I think. Yeah. I don't want to touch on that. Can I can I just ask also, um are do Sussex police have any undercover police people still? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to answer that, but it will be handy, you know. 
you know. Um, yeah, we do have to name both offices, and okay. nothing stops even myself saying, right, we're going to be operation in these three states. Yeah. Um, for, for the next three hours, the whole question, I'll come in as we can kind of walk around. Okay. We can do that well, as, as, as a final um, basis. We don't have so, to be trained. So, so hypothetically, if we led you to some uh, suspicious premises that we felt, you know, could be a good lead for you with yeah. Intel. Would, yeah. would that be something that? Yes, yeah, so by all means, give us a call or put through in, official put channels, channels, of through course. Channels, yeah. Not we can then build up and try and work on yeah. um, doing okay. uh, warrants and things like that. Okay, well, I think that would. Okay, thank you. Uh, councillors, any one points? One. Yeah, councillors. Um, I think it was the last um, committee meeting we discussed some of the problems we're having around the train station. Yes. And I wondered if, yeah, the car park, but also if we're honest, it's also the roads around uh, right in front of the station. I think actually probably mm -hmm. it's much broader than that. I walk back down the Worth Way from there, so I walk past the car park, but there's obviously um, some residual problems there. And a lot of that is drugs, as far as I can see. People buying and selling and using drugs along there. And it's uh, obviously a gateway to the town. Lots of people are coming through there for commuting. I wondered if there was any progress or further developments or any advice on how we might look at that particular part of town. Yeah, so I've been in contact with I think the BTP that mm. you should run the car park itself, but because it's obviously so close to us, we do we're going to do an operation with them. Mm. Um, and not only the two sides of the city, so our shift have not aligned, but I've asked either my team to the rest of the work or their team so we can do some sort of work on that. Um, again, that just takes us to do some door knocks along the house and stuff like that around mm -hmm. the area to see what times, places, things like that, to so start to do a commute to get around. Um, and again, based on the intel that comes in, we can collect the mm -hmm. control those mm -hmm. times. Um, and again, with Chris, or any of those pieces, mm -hmm. those, they've been told to park in the car park, which I appreciate is not the actual issue. Mm -hmm. And then to walk around the area, walk up yeah. and down, put the right. I, I can attest that because I came back from London on this Tuesday evening yes. after 6.15 or 20 <coughs> and there were three uh, British Transport uh, Police mm -hmm. and Network Rail Police, but four of you guys mm -hmm. waiting in a ring and it was very encouraging to kind of see, you know, um, so that, you know, you obviously got some intel or somebody radio down the line or some, or you were, you know, but that really worked and everybody was thinking, Wow, that really, the perception of that was terrific. So, you know, that, that definitely works. That Lovely. almost answers the question. Yeah, so, personal you. experience. So, thank you for saying that. <laughs> uh, Councillor Gibson. Uh, yeah, two two questions. Um, the first is whether or not uh, you're seeing any reaction from the, the making of nitrous oxide. Uh, um, pretty well, isn't it? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say the second one as well, which yeah, is yeah. that uh, just. I'm seeing that certainly in the rural world increased reporting of fly tipping. Yes. Uh, I just wondered whether that was, you know, sort of what the position was on that. So the, the fly tipping, I have to answer the second question, um, mm -hmm. has always been there in the last 14 years. I've been <coughs> um, it probably has increased a little bit because of all the new regulations that come in. Um, that is very hard to cross the police and it's very easy for us to go, oh yeah, it's not on the road, whether it's down to council, but we really have to do it and catch to doing it. We do have um, regular suspects, of course, that are putting it, who we <coughs> but would say or generalize that it, it would be the, this person, because but again, it's trying to prove who's doing it, when they're doing it. Um, as and when we do find a, a pile of stuff, we can look through it and see what's in it. And if we can find name addresses, we can go back to those people who quite, who quite often are innocent, but they say that I've um, organized for this person come in to clear my house mm -hmm. or clear whatever they've done, and they're then going to it. So we do try and sort of work our way back <coughs> from the evidence to see what we can find out with that. There's also the rural crime team, which this is sort of, I don't want to say newest one for a while, but I do target that. That is one of their, their main things dealing with it. Um, so again, we work together with, with them as well as us. Um, and then we will... Nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide. Yes, we've seen the um, 
well, the, the artifacts first, just to see the actual containers left lying all over the place. Um, it used to be a legal high, thankfully it's not been changed, so we are going to have to do a lot more about that. With that. So that will be raised quite quickly now. So that's how we'll be looking to deal with that as much as possible. Okay, thank you very much. I'm mindful of time we have a full agenda. So, Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your time this evening for the lovely updates. Um, look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming in on your uh, day oh, So day. huge double double appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Have a good rest of the evening. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, moving on then. Uh, so uh, agenda item six is uh, Queen Victoria Hospital update. And I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to welcome uh, uh, James Lowell. <laughs> Uh, to the Town Council Chamber, who is the new Chief Executive of the Queen Victoria Hospital. So, very warm welcome, James, and the table and the floor. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome, uh, which is what I've received from East Kingston and Queen Victoria Hospital since I've arrived. So, I'm now into my third month uh, in Queen Victoria HS Foundation Trust, and everyone has just been so welcoming. Staff have been fantastically welcoming, so great the population. And it's just really heartening to see it's such a great place to work. And, and the staff really are as friendly as it appears mm -hmm. when you walk around and meet people. When I speak to patients in the hospital, I ask them how their experiences, I ask them about their the food, I ask them about how their treatment is, and I genuinely have such positive <coughs> experiences that I've not seen in other organisations I've worked in over my career to that level. So it's just fantastic to see. A little bit about myself. So now 26 years in the NHS. I started off as a porter actually at Guy's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I was at GST for just over 23 years. All in all, 22 years I was at Guy St. Thomas's. And I um, worked my way up and I got an apprenticeship in pathology. So I've got a, a real passion for apprenticeships in healthcare uh, and social care to make sure that we offer opportunity to our local people to get employment they might not have had access to previously, and then they can get careers through uh, health and social care. So I've got a real personal passion, which actually leads in a bit to the strategic work we're doing at QH. I spent a long time at Gardner St. Thomas and, and did quite a few things. I ended up as a <coughs> general manager for um, pathology, uh, clinical imaging, pharmacy, therapy, those sorts of services. Um, and then I went to work at Melbourne Foundation Trust, as part of the team that were working there as we were coming at quality special measures. So I was there for a number of years and we exited quality special measures, which was great. Uh, and that was uh, a really, really important time for me. And um, when I moved back to Kent, I then moved out to Tombridge Wells to actually live locally to Queen uh, Victoria now. And um, I then did a number of jobs in the system, so I did some system work, system transformation type things. So I was bringing together an integrated care system, uh, an integrated care partnership for Medway and Swale. That's health and social care coming together with primary care um, and all system partners. I then went on to, in the COVID time, uh, work on assistance transformation and recovery. So I was the restart director for all services across Kent and Medway for health and social care, trying to make sure we restarted all the work that we'd done pre-COVID. And that was just after the first wave. And it was then I had a lot to do with Queen Victoria Hospital as well. I then went and spent a couple of years at um, South London and Mortley, the NHS Foundation Trust because I've never worked in mental health services in my career, and I know that's a big gap for me, to be honest. And I really wanted to understand how mental health services worked, mm -hmm. so I was lucky enough to be appointed as the Chief Operating Officer at SLAM, which is the largest, or is the largest specialist mental health trust in the country, and that was really, really, really helpful for me. So I spent a few years there. I was also the Director for SELOP, um, based-based Executive Director, so the old, what was known as CCGs, as we formed the new integrated care boards, Whilst being the Chief Operating Officer of SLAM, I was also the place based Executive Director for all of Southwark Place. That was Health and Social Care, trying to bring those together as well. Um, and then, luckily, I was appointed as the Chief Executive Officer for Queen Victoria, and I've been here for almost the well, to our third month now. So uh, that's a positive history of me. Just very briefly, where are we uh, with regards to our strategy? So I think last time, Abigail, Came to speak with you about our strategy and development of the strategy for QH. So we've had a bit of a uh, an interesting time over the last few years. And I think there's been conversations about organisations coming together. Was that right for Queen Victoria Hospital? And I think it was a bit, that wasn't the right way forward for the Queen Vic as it was at the time. So we agreed that merger wasn't actually the way forward for us as an organisation. 
and actually less and less mergers are on the cards for NHS um, organisations. It's more about collaborations and partnerships now. If you look at the way the things are going nationally. So really our strategy is built on a number of different pillars. We've got three elements to the strategy. We're looking at our specialist work that we provide nationally, so to loads of people uh, up and down the country, and some people from other, other countries have come to get our specialist services. And that's one of the strategies we're looking at, what we do in that space, how do we grow what we need to, how do we make sure we've got the uh, services we need for the future, and what do the specialist commissioning nationally want to buy and want QBH to provide for the country. And then we've got our other specialist work that we pro provide mainly for Kent, Surrey and Sussex, mm -hmm. but some people come from London because we are specialists in what we do, and we're a centre of excellence for a lot of things. So people will access our services from around the free and state of care systems that we have in and around. And we're working with those different ICSs and those partners to say, what, what does QDH in the future look like for you in your clinical strategies? So we can start to bring all that information together. Um, and then the third element of our strategy is our local neighbourhood strategy. So being an anchor institution, uh, a big organisation, a big employer, anchored in East Grinstead, because that's where we are, that's our, that's our neighbourhood. How do um, local residents want to access our services and how do we work well with primary care and other stakeholders to make sure that we're all providing collectively the services that the local population wants to receive and how do we also offer good employment and employment prospects for local communities. So we're working very hard in there and working with uh, colleagues in, in your um, practice and uh, others. And we've got another session, I think, to develop the strategic options. So we've got our community diagnostic centre that's been built at Queen Vic. We've got the minor injuries <coughs> unit. We have some primary care on site for limited periods of time. And we have a shared population. And how do we then design some of the options for the future and what that might look like? I think underpinning all of this, there's a lot of different options for QVH that we could pursue. But it's really what's right for the organisation and what's right for the local population, informed with what different partners in Kenso and Sussex nationally and locally want for us. And, and then what will be viable for the future. So we're bringing all those things together. We've had now 149 engagement sessions with different stakeholders from different parts of the country and ICSs and different organisations. We've engaged with over 1,900 people who have specifically engaged with us on what they think the strategy needs to look like and give their opinions. And we've had 341 people also put their opinions in via our online portal. So we're bringing all that information together and we have employed a specialist um, researcher to look at the themes that are coming through. So we're not just marking our own homework, we're getting the opinion of, a, of an academic researcher to look at everything that's coming through to make sure we've got the right themes um, and potential options. We're then pulling those together and we'll take those through our, our partners, so back out to people that we've engaged with, back out to our board and our, and our staff to see what they think of the emerging priorities. And then really sort of back in the middle of next year, we will then start to properly engage with the integrated care boards and people like ourselves to say, this is what the strategy is looking like. This is what we believe the future of Queen Victoria Hospital looks like over the next five to 10 years. And, and is this, how does this work for yourselves? And then we'll start to pursue those strategies. So sort of midway through the strategy development, it's going really well so far. I think the staff are really excited. People have engaged with are excited. We've had some really frank views, which is good. And we genuinely are trying to design what the thing looks like for the future. I think one thing that's really important for anyone that's walked around the site, it's old and it's tired. And there's only so much we can do with the fabric of this state we have. So, and it's in our public board papers. If you look at the backlog maintenance and how much we would need for the hospital, there's 34 million pounds worth of work that needs to be done. Well, if there's 34 million pounds worth of work that needs to be done, 100 million pounds will rebuild the hospital site. So once we've landed at the strategies that like inform nationally, across the systems in the region and locally, that will tell us whether actually for the country and for the region it's right to rebuild the hospital or put services elsewhere or carry on as we are and try to find some of that 34 million to make the best we can of the estate. And I think that will follow on from when the clinical strategy has been uh, developed and finalised. So yeah, really exciting stuff that we're doing, really, really important stuff. Um, and we're halfway through, it's been done really well so far. So I'm really enthused. Wow. Wow, that's that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, all, all for memory, I can tell. Uh, so it's going all right then for three months. You, you've been pretty <laughs> busy by the look of it. Well, I'm still getting on <laughs> Yeah, you know. Yeah. Could, could you just say the Community Diagnostic Centre, you say that's under construction. What stage is that? Can you so, just tell us a bit more about that? So some of the services we're already providing, so some of the physiological diagnostic services we're starting to provide. 
So it will do some of the work already. And we're at the design stage where the actual part of the building looks like. We're really engaged with yourself and your colleagues mm -hmm. as you actually get that process. Because we, we've got an opportunity to look at our monitor injuries and our, 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 our diagnostic centres to make sure it's designed properly to, to meet the needs of the population. Is this a new build construction or a refurb or a reuse of a building? It will be able to modular unit. Right, OK. Site. Which unfortunately is a bit of a feature of Q. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK. But, uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, councillors, thank you very much. Uh, for, for that fantastic summary. Councillors, any comments or questions? <coughs> so Gibson. Um, talking about buildings and maintenance, um, then I mean, do you, as part of the strategy, it's a clinical strategy, but do you have a net zero target? Okay. And, and what is the, what are you doing about decarbonisation of the buildings, or is that part of the £34 million? So we've got a green plan at the moment, and we've got ambitions for 2040 to be at zero carbon. And we are starting to reduce emissions when we can already. So some of the um, anaesthetic gases we use, for example, have got a massive carbon footprint. And we started to pull back on using some of those using alternatives. So we've already started along the um, zero carbon uh, for 2040 and 2045 on our emissions. But there's more to do. The buildings don't help us actually there, but we do have a green plan and we're looking to it. I hadn't thought about it. Yeah, thank Gases. you. <laughs> 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 uh, <coughs> Cycle minor injuries unit, which I'm sure we've all been there with uh, with various members of the family and all the rest over the years, um, <coughs> many times over. Um, one of the, the areas in the hospital which uh, local communities got quite a strong tie in with, I suppose it's Burns and that's the mm -hmm. initial sort of thing which has gone up and down over the years as to whether it was under threat, whether it's um, because of the size of the hospital, best, how how uh, best to make it uh, an ongoing part of the hospital. So I like your, your views on the current state of that, or likely state of that. Um, the last time I was in there, there was certainly uh, staff from outside of the area. Mm -hmm. um, so what is your position as far as staffing was just sort of um, importing people for, for um, uh, sickness absence and things like that, it's somebody from Essex Trust, I think, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So is, uh, how are your staffing issues? So, um, all the services are being looked at to see if they look their fun at financially and viable uh, for the future, but also whether it's the right format <coughs> for the local population and the right to configure the services. And we're trying to do it in a, in a Sussex base, but also Kent, Surrey and Sussex, mm -hmm. and what's really needed. Now, if it comes out through this, this, this piece of work that actually Burns should stay at Queen Victoria Hospital for a load of good reasons, then that'll be the strategy we're agreeing to take forward. So we're looking at absolutely everything that we do uh, provide. We haven't taken a decision on any of the service lines. I know there's a, a, a huge historical connection to us um, providing burns to care, and we do it very, very well. And so we know that. And that's a strong part of the work motivation as we work through. But at the moment, we've taken no decisions. I think it's really important to say that. And we will take decisions in collaboration and partnership with people. We know that we now have decisions that aren't right for local populations, health and care services, uh, and our, our organisation that we work through together with people. The other question, staffing. Actually, staffing is really, really tricky in health and social care for all providers. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, there's huge um, staffing gaps in, in many different organisations. We're actually not that bad as far as organisations go because we are a great place to work. We still have vacancies, but it's nowhere near as bad as other places. So we're very lucky in that respect. Uh, mm -hmm. We will look to employ people on our bank, so people sometimes want to pick up extra shifts. Mm -hmm. People that might live locally, might work elsewhere, might want to pick up some extra shifts working with us. And then we do also bring people in from other countries that want to come and work with us. And I think we've got a large community of people that come across from other countries yeah. that have been uh, in the local town and got a great history yeah. there as well. In fact, we have some accommodation on site just for um, staff that come from other countries and uh, then want to work in our organisation. But we also have a really good, <coughs> a, 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 at the moment we're doing really well with apprenticeships. 
is I've just gave two certificates to operating departmental practitioners that have been for our apprenticeship routes that come in as assistants and then become fully qualified. And actually, we, I think we've got apprenticeships on a scale that a lot of other organisations don't have. We want to grow our own local talent and give people qualifications and careers. And that's really important. Really important. Yeah, point. Well, I just, I'd like to bring, as we've got uh, Dr. Allen here, I don't know if you had any questions <coughs> or comments you'd like to make. Uh, many time. comments. Um, I, in fact, actually, Julia, I think Manesh is outside. Oh, is that? Oh, 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 oh. I might give him the impression I was meeting you outside to <laughs> the last half. Of the <laughs> I think it's really, really important to state what a happy environment we've been with all hospitals. And I've been fortunate to work with it for 20 years, and I know everyone at this table has spent two hours in the, <laughs> in the wind of boo room. Um, maybe. And what I think is very difficult to get exceptional outside this visit is how rare that is in a hospital trust. I mean, we've worked at GSP, it's an amazing place. I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, and recruitment in the NHS for summer is going to be problematic. So your example of people coming from the Essex Trust to work yeah. here, I think is a rarity, um, but we do have to reach our pencils out further than we did originally. Brexit has also created a lot of problems with staffing in the NHS. It's really a major problem. So the key thing is really to say that Manesh particularly is very closely involved with working with QDH and modeling services. We're not reinventing the wheel. We've got a lot of information predating your arrival about what works for the town and what the town wants. And then, as I say, we can talk about it more deeply embedded in making sure, particularly the things that the, that the town see, which is minor injuries, x ray, mm -hmm. parking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the three big things that people complain to you about are, you know, depending on that, A, what health needs, B, providers, and B, what their plan is. Can I just ask everybody just to raise their voice? This is being recorded. So just the little um, yeah. teapot here has to <laughs> has to pick up. So you just pick up your voice a little bit. Dr. Patel, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. I know you just come in. So very warm welcome. Very warm welcome. No, no, no. Sure. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Well, you just talked about the relationship between the relationship between the work you guys doing together at the moment. I think the narrative we want to uh, set out and set into reality is really how um, uh, you know what is a very fragmented and unfortunately fragmenting uh, system in something that is much more focused around neighbourhood care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and if you look at if you look at the Fuller report, you know, um, which was sort of written for NHC, and it's very much based on the principle that you need to understand what your community actually needs. Uh, and you know, uh, work out the sort of connections that are going to um, meet those needs and look at the skill sets that we have to, to deliver them. Now, you know, that's the, the context there is that uh, there isn't a single organization here that couldn't do with more resources in order to deliver what it's currently trying to deliver. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, if, I, if I'm honest, the system is driven very much and I'm sure you'll, you'll back me up on this, but having worked in the system at various levels myself, uh, you know, I'm aware that, um, you know, James, for example, will be <coughs> extreme pressure to meet his waiting time targets, uh, when in fact, actually, no one has really spent enough time and energy really thinking about the underlying drivers that determine people's ill health, um, you know, which is often multifactorial, primarily around things like housing, education, employment, uh, you know, safe, safe spaces in our communities, access to, to uh, sort of healthy activities and things like that. Um, and unfortunately, we don't spend enough time and resource on, on those things. But you know, taking a much more neighbourhood approach to um, people's care, we need to start thinking about how we work with the wider elements of our community around delivering the plan. Um, if frankly the NHS isn't the answer for everything, it's not the answer for everything. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence that you know 80% of our health outcomes have absolutely nothing to do with health and health interventions. Uh, you know, um, yet all our entire focus is around health interventions. Thank you. Um, Councillor Gibson. 
Yeah, I was just going to echo that. Um, I'm seeing an increasing number of um, um, housing, social housing tenants who come with a problem and then <coughs> almost seem to finish the conversation with it, it, it's adversely affecting my mental health. Um, and that's something which I, I've, I've never seen before. It, it, it's quite, you know, I mean, I find that almost quite extraordinary that that is, you know, sort of, that, that, that it, it, it seems to have become an inbuilt reaction. And whether or not it, that there isn't the resilience in society to sort of face up to pressures anymore, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it, I mean, it's also, you, you see stats like 10% of the population can't face up to the working day and things like that. It's, it's quite okay. extraordinary. Um, yeah. I'm very conscious of times and games. Um, we, we also have um, Penny Ford and Karen Salas, I think, from the Integrated Care Board on, on the line. James, I don't know if there's anything you might want to <coughs> make in this obviously, to your presentation and the Q&A. Um, they are next on the agenda. But if there's anything you might or might not like to say. A couple of things to add. So I think, I think there's something that there is about mental health internationally. I think people are a lot more willing to talk about mental health issues now than they might be previously. There's a lot of campaigns to get people to speak on about their mental health. And um, so we see some of that as well, but actually there are questions. I think many young people now, they might be previously, but so there has been an increase in instances of serious mental health issues and, and more people accessing talking therapies. And you can see that in statistics. Part of it, I think, is people are uh, less stigmatised and people are more willing to talk about things. So you might see some of that come out in those conversations. I think with the integrated care teams, we're working well with the RCB, so the integrated care board and the integrated care system. We're working what the integrated care team needs to look like and what does our neighbourhood provision within that look like and how do we develop that? Because our neighbourhood is slightly different to the integrated community team of mid so we're sort of subset of that. And we're working with Penny and the team as well to say how do we articulate that. I should have also said that one of my other roles is I am the uh, Senior Responsible Officer for Planning Care Diagnostics and Cancer for the RCB. So it was, was the CEO for QGH, that's also the, hat, the other hat I wear in the system to try to uh, develop different ways of working through cancer diagnostics and planning care across all of Sussex. And that was very deliberate to make sure that QGH have got a voice in the system, and that's really demonstrated well through that, that uh, role that I have as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we, I think... We've never had so many medical experts in this chamber at any one time this evening. Uh, and, we got, and, and, and I include uh, Penny and Karen, very warm welcome to you on that. Um, so I think we're all aware that it, it, it is fragmented. Dr. Patel, you, you mentioned that already. James, you've mentioned that. Um, and it's for us lay people in medical terms, it's, it's some sort of reassurance that you are working together and the jigsaw comes together. <coughs> I, I believe is in East Grinstead. Um, uh, but you know, clearly there's a lot a lot more to do. Um, really, but I, what I would say, James, is that um, uh, you, you will know that some current councillors are, are very closely um, involved at Queen Victoria Hospital and, and ex councillors. And, um, and, and I've done a bit of intel, and I think they're all very, very pleased that you're in the hot seat now. Uh, and um, the, the reports back are, are really, really good. So thank you very much um, for, for um, you know, for being here this evening, <laughs> Councillor. Just to echo that, thank you, James. I'm sure everyone will agree your enthusiasm and your knowledge, speaking without notes after I mean, it's hugely impressive. So um, welcome and congratulations. And we look forward to you seeing plans as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in and, uh, and, and good luck. And, the door was always open here. Obviously, you know, you work very closely with the, with the town clerk. <coughs> Historically, this town council has with Queen Victoria Hospital. Mm -hmm. and an asset to the town. Right, that is minuted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome to stay, but appreciate you. But you're a very busy chap. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we now move on to obviously a, a very much a related subject. Um, we are um, delighted and thrilled to have uh, Penny and Karen from the Integrated Care Board. Thank you very much uh, again for uh, on on Zoom. Um, some context background. Obviously, um, you uh, were sort of invited back in back in June to the to this committee. 
particularly in relation to the uh, modality uh, situation in, in East Grinstead and beyond. So, um, Penny, I know that um, you very recently, we've seen sight of uh, a letter that, that you exchanged with Councillor Lanza, I think, from West Sussex County Council, um, and um, which summarised the situation as at early November, principally in terms of modality. And this, this town council obviously was not responsible for any medical output as such, but we are a conduit for facilitation, for communication, messaging, and to try and bring people together. And uh, we, you know, we, so maybe if I could pass over to you, if you could just touch on an update from that letter and any, any other relevant information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's lovely to be here. I'm really sorry that we weren't able to make it in uh, in person. So uh, sorry for that, but I'm, I'm glad we've been able to kind of join on Zoom. Uh, when people are at the further end of the table, it's quite hard to hear. So if we are having a conversation, maybe if people at the far end, as it were, uh, could speak up, that would be great. But we've, I think we've heard most of it. And there's some very common themes. Uh, what I'd like to do, if it's all right, um, I'll start by introducing and, and then hand over to Karen. Um, so I'm Penny Ford. Um, I'm the Executive Managing Director for West Sussex, for NHS Sussex. So I look after the totality of the West Sussex <coughs> play. And I have with me Karen Salis, who is our Head of Primary Care for West Sussex and who will say a bit more about the primary care aspects that you've uh, talked about. But I thought it might just be an opportunity and it really resonates with some of the conversation actually that you've just been having to just set the context and say a little bit about what an, uh, what an integrated care system is, if that's OK, and what our strategy is, because I think it, it absolutely re resonates with, with uh, what uh, Dr. Patel was saying about the uh, about the fragmentation and where we need to focus. So, so and there's lots of information about this on our website for people who want to kind of know more about it in detail. But just a high level, the integrated care systems were set up in uh, July 2022. They're quite different from previous organisations. Um, our integrated care system is across Sussex, so it's a, so we're a Sussex integrated care system. And the four purposes of an integrated care system are improving population health and healthcare, tackling in unequal outcomes and access, enhancing productivity and value for money, and, and helping the NHS to support broader and social economic development. And, and that's, that's quite different from the uh, purposes, as it were, of some of the sort of predecessor organisations. That's a new thing about specific remit around that broader, broader partnership work. The ICS, we, there's a lot of acronyms uh, in, the, in the NHS, which is in itself an acronym, uh, but there's lots of acronyms. So the integrated care system uh, is, uh, describes the, the kind of the totality of the health and care system. And there's two main elements. There's a, a, what, what in the guidance is called an integrated care partnership, but we, we describe it as our Sussex Health and Care Assembly. It's a partnership, it's a, it's a statutory committee of the uh, local authorities and, uh, and uh, the health system, so the integrated care board. And its uh, main role is about agreeing the strategy to improve health and care for the population of Sussex. Um, the local authorities on that are providers and representatives, but also um, education, universities, business, voluntary sector. So it's quite a wide partnership and that's our assembly. And then we have what you'll see called the Integrated Care Board or NHS Sussex. So we're NHS Sussex Integrated Care Board. That's the sort of more, I suppose, kind of executive bit of the system, if I can describe it that way, uh, to support delivery of the integrated care strategy. That's the, the section that uh, allocates NHS resource and it oversees the performance and delivery and information. So those kind of uh, uh, what you might think of as executive functions. And we work very closely with our three uh, places, our three local authorities, our upper tier local authorities, very much in particular with the health and wellbeing boards uh, of each place. So there's a direct relationship between the, um, the for, so us, for the West Sussex Health and Wellbeing Board and the Health and Wellbeing Strategy and the work of the ICS and our strategy. So they're very kind of directly uh, directly aligned. 
Um, and one of the first things that we wanted to do as, a, as a, an integrated care system, so the focus over the last year has been developing our strategy, which is, you may have seen it uh, publicised, it's improving lives together. That sets out our ambition over the next five years. So it's a five year strategy uh, and how we aim to improve the lives of local people um, and, and help them live longer. We know that we've got a lot of challenges. We've got a, a growing and aging population. We've got unequal access to care. We've got the impact of the pandemic, cost of living. Um, we know we've got an increased need for services. Um, we've only got finite resources and we know that our patient experience can be disjointed. It's not always what we would want. And our strategy talks about how we'll address that, focusing on how we start well, live well, age well, help people get care, but also support our staff. And, you know, you've, you've talked a bit uh, about that, that piece about our staff. So that's sort of some of the challenges and the key areas of focus. So that's in the strategy, but it's not just about having a strategy. It's also about having a plan to deliver that. So really importantly, we have a shared delivery plan um, and um, uh, that's developed with our partners. And it's got a number of priority areas. So um, we've got sort of four main areas for improvement. So we've got some long-term, some immediate, uh, some continuous uh, improvement. Um, and we've got our um, de delivery of those health and wellbeing strategies that we talked about. Okay, sorry to interrupt you, sorry. Um, sorry, you're, yeah. You're in, you're in full flow there. So um, can, I, can I just interject? Yeah, because I'm very, very conscious We've got James, uh, Dr. Patel, and Dr. Allen uh, in, in the room, who are, I'm sure are, are completely uh, understanding of, of, of what you're saying. And I think we understand the overall strategy. So thank you for explaining that. But whilst they're here in this room, um, we'd like to try and get uh, a really just a discussion and drill down onto some specifics uh, that, that maybe yeah. they, they can have a dialogue with you for the next sort of 10, 15 minutes, really, because time is of the essence and you're all very, very busy people. Yeah. So I just wanted to set the context, but um, I won't go through all the priorities in the, in the strategy, but the one that I wanted to draw out in that context is that one of our key priorities about is about how we develop integrated community teams. Uh, and we've made a commitment to develop uh, 16 across Sussex. So the, the, the main footprint is uh, with our district and boroughs. We do recognise that within that, especially in some of our bigger districts and boroughs, uh, the actual how we work at neighbourhoods might be a sort of slightly smaller footprint uh, than that. And it's absolutely about how we redesign how we organise our services in the community, working with primary care, community services, wider community assets, uh, districts, boroughs, local services, and, and a whole range of voluntary sector and other partners to organise our care differently, work differently with our communities and try and give our, um, our populations a more joined up uh, a kind of a more joined up approach. And you've heard both um, Dr. Patel and uh, James uh, talk about that piece of work, about working with local communities and working uh, to develop those integrated neighbourhood, that neighbourhood approach. So I just wanted to set it in that context that that's absolutely at the heart of what the integrated care system is trying to do. So that's at the, it's one of our kind of top priorities. It's a big programme of work. Um, it's fairly new. We haven't got there yet, um, so a long way to go, but that's absolutely the principle of it. Can and I, I think yeah. I just learn that, and then maybe Karen might want to say something then just moving on about the specifics around primary care, which I think is the other aspect you were specifically interested in. Uh, I mean, we've already heard this evening, obviously, that uh, uh, Queen Victoria <coughs> and Mokefield and I'm sure other surgeries are working closely together in East Grimsley, which I'm sure, I'm sure you would agree. So, but really what I'm trying to get out tonight with the experts in the room here is um, is there any is there any other dialogue support um, initiatives between James Dr Patel and Dr Allen um, that you'd like to raise with, with Penny and Penny and Karen whilst we're in this room because that's really the crux of what I'm trying to get to James 
You are actually looking directly at Penny because that's the camera is as well. Okay, yeah, crack on, James. <laughs> I think it's really important to note that so it's Queen Victoria Hospital, we're part of the integrated community team steering group. So when we're looking at the 16 across Sussex, we've actually got a seat around that table and, and we're helping them develop what that might look like. What we're also trying to do is make sure that um, within East Grinstead, we've also got the voice of East Grinstead, and I know Penny's alluded to it, but we've spoken quite um, a lot about what does that mean to us as a neighbourhood, because mm -hmm. we are local population don't necessarily identify as they live in Mid Sussex, or identify as they live in East Grinstead. Mm -hmm. And actually, how do we make sure that we've got the right East Grinstead flavour for our neighbourhood services and how they can figure in what we may need here, versus how does that work with the integrated community team? And I think Penny's right in saying we haven't quite designed that well yet, but we're in the process of doing it. But I'm more assured that we've actually got a seat around that table, and I'm very grateful that we've been invited to be part of that conversation. And that's why our work together, I think we've got another four hours together, next group, is that right? To try to work out our priorities. Yeah. Do Dr. Patel, there. I don't know if you have anything to add to what James has said about that. Um, if, if I'm honest, I don't think I would care if it's been very uh, you know, connected into the NHP business. Perhaps you, you are, you know, I think some of the larger organisations are. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, I'm, I can't hear you very well. I don't, I don't know if you can shout at me a bit. <laughs> if we ask you to come and sit over here, you'll be so yeah. much closer to the mic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Rinesh. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's fair to say, I don't think primary care feels as engaged in the ICB strategy. And, I, and I'm not saying that as a personal opinion. I say that as someone who talks to primary care network directors. So as you know, we are arranged around primary care networks and East Grimsby uh, and Crawley Down and a little bit of Burgess Hill is a primary care network. Um, but that, that, that is perhaps by the by. I mean, the, the important thing here is that if you look at health improvement, health and well-being improvement, it happens when a small group of people interact with another small group of people or an individual interacts with another individual. That's health improvement. And whether that's with me or Deborah or a health coach or a physiotherapist or a volunteer, that is what creates health improvement. So until the system arranges itself around implementing something that enables local people to work together to deliver that. And it has to be done stepwise, trying to plan things at grand scale, in my experience, <coughs> has never worked all that well. Strategies at scale work, but delivery has to happen locally. So I think until we see uh, that sort of materializing, and that's our responsibility as much as anybody else's you know, uh, across the NHS, as well as uh, other public uh, services. Until we do that, we won't start seeing the sort of health improvements that we're looking for. That's fundamentally <coughs> Can, I, Can I just follow on from that? James, you said you had a seat at the table mm -hmm. with, with the ICB. Yes. Dr. Patel, do you similarly have a seat at whatever table this is? I, I'm not in a senior position within the system anymore, so I wouldn't expect to have a seat at the table, but I'm more interested in having a seat at the table of the local conversations where where we can get things done. That's that's my uh, driver, shall we say, but there are other people. Okay, right. yeah. 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 We have a primary care network, but I have to say networks were uh, not as well conceived and executed as they could have been. They're very much based around a contract that, that's been handed down. And a, a lot of primary care networks have made more of that than I think we have. I think we've had a lot of challenges in East Grimstead around uh, you know, delivering primary care, which you're already familiar with. Um, but I, th I think we are in the process of renewing our relationships across the system, especially with Queen Victoria Hospital, yeah. 
in order to drive some of this forward. Um, because for, for, for a lot of different reasons, it, Queen, Queen Victoria Hospital has been very much caught up in the destruction of being absorbed by other organisations. That's now gone, thankfully. So it gives us all a little bit of headspace mm -hmm. to go away and think about how we're going to do some things differently. I, I do feel that some of our other larger organisations would improve how they are engaging in those very local conversations. Uh, so, for example, delivering community services and mental health provision, which we talked about earlier, we need much better engagement at local level from those very large organisations around how we're going to deliver things differently at a local level, um, because we know that provision is not adequate. Okay, I'm mindful of time. I do, uh, Penny and Karen, I do want to touch on modality. Can you, can you, I will come to you, Councillor Farron. Yes, uh, but I, 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 wonder, I wonder perhaps we could just have a sort of two cent summary of the issue. Sorry to. Yeah, please do. Karen, which please is do. in Grimstead, in the primary care, there was a disparity in provision between various providers. Mm -hmm. And there is a frustration with a lot of our population about how they access health. Mm -hmm. And we are all trying to solve mm -hmm. that problem. Mm -hmm. For us, there are immediate things that we feel we could be assisted with and help with that problem. And there's obviously a long-term issue with how things are going to look in a year, two years, three years. And that also includes our discussion. But Manette has got a lot of very interesting data and simple explanations to give you. I hope we've got time to put some of that in. But a lot of it's about how we can seek help from the ICD and having you all here to help us inform that discussion with them while we come today, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, you haven't. No, no, no not at all. I mean, that's why I've got, I mean, but I'm, I'm very conscious of time. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, as I said before, we've got the medical experts in the room to have the interaction. We could talk all night, but we haven't got time to talk all night. Um, is, th is there something um, in particular that you could, we could continue this communication in, in writing by the town clerk through the ICB, or you're doing it directly with the ICB? Um, <coughs> I think in my, in my opinion, um, the Town Council and the services arranged around the town, which are not necessarily NHS services, <coughs> need to play a much bigger part in those conversations that we are beginning to have around how we do things differently. Um, I think that's the more meaningful conversation for us to have and to be able to feed up into the ICB yeah. and, and hopefully to have support to be able to make some of those things happen. That, that for me, yeah. feels the right approach. Okay, Penny, would you like to comment on both what James and Dr. Sam said? Yeah, thank you. And I, I will, I'll keep, I'll keep it brief. And as I said, some, some of it's a bit difficult to, to hear, but, but broadly speaking, I actually agree. I think the really interesting piece is about those local conversations about how we do things differently. Um, I think it's absolutely right that there's been a, a bit of a shortage of headspace to do that. I think now's the time to do it. That there are um, uh, PCN representatives and, and, and also uh, representatives of, of the, the GP federations involved in the, the various steering groups, etc. But but it's absolutely right. There is something really powerful about those local conversations about aspects that are much wider than the bits that NHS services provide. It's about the local services, the local people, um, what you were talking about, about some of those issues around uh, uh, crime or um, uh, drug misuse or housing or accommodation. And I'd really welcome, if those local conversations are happening, I'd be really welcome those being fed into our thinking, both to inform our wider thinking, but also then to inform. So in terms of developing our integrated community approach for, uh, for Mid-Sussex, what does that look like? And, and what's what is it that's different for, say, the East Grinstead area than it is for another part of Mid-Sussex? Because not everywhere area is the same. So I'd really welcome that feed through in the way that um, uh, Minesh described, that feed through into our conversations. Um, we do have a local community network in Mid-Sussex, uh, chaired by... Um, a colleague from Mid Sussex District Council, uh, and that's one. Of, that's that's one of the forums for feeding it through. But it's not the only one. Thank you. Um, um, if you want something more about primary care in any detail, then I turn to Karen. Okay, um, 
can I just come back onto modality? Because it, it, we've yeah. been going down towards. Can, can you just give us any any sort of update? Because I know that Dr. Patel and Dr. Allen and maybe James want to come in because of um, obviously it's an ongoing situation. We understand that it's an operational situation. So maybe you could just give us a potted update and then I'll bring in Dr. Patel I'll, on that. I'll turn to Karen to give you the potted update. She's uh, closer to the detail. Thank you. Yes, so um, I, I know that you're all aware of the of the background and um, with modality, with the local uh, population um, showing that that they they weren't happy with uh, how they were being able to access services at modality. The Care Quality Commission, who went in and did an inspection, um, and the resulting inadequate rating that came from that. Um, the latest update is we have had the three month official meeting with CQC um, modality and ourselves where the work that modality have done up until this point uh, the action plan that they have put together for um, making sure that they they uh, address all the concerns that CQC and and their patients have have raised and was discussed and, and reviewed um, CQC are very happy actually with with uh, the direction that uh, modality are going in and um, the work that they've done so far in, in addressing to make sure that, that there weren't um, patient safety concerns. Uh, so the emphasis now is, is on, uh, we, we're keeping in re very regular contact with them um, and the emphasis is on making sure that action plan continues to be followed and that any new processes and, and services are embedded in in the sort of ongoing working of the practice i think so that's that's one side of it for um modality they they are also um giving very regular updates via their websites and, and newsletters and they are just about to um publish a new one in the next week i think to show um the progress they've made since their their last uh patient update um the other side of things of course it is uh you know, East Grinstead as a whole. So as 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 an ICB, I sort of very much looking at the at the whole area rather than one provider or another. And um, I, 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 as has been discussed, I know that uh, Moatfield, uh, you know, are, are talking with um, QVH. Um, I know Amy Galea, who is our uh, sort of uh, director, is, has also been um, had discussions with James. I think um, along that and. We were recently uh, modality uh, applied to be able to close their list for six months, which would have meant that they wouldn't have registered any patients at all for the next six months. Um, this was considered. We asked the, the local practices who surround modality, not just in Moatfield, but around the other edges of their of their boundary, um, their thoughts, and we considered the impact that this would have. On the whole area and we know that everyone is uh, facing uh, huge challenges in, in managing the demand and so the request to close the list um, was not approved uh, so it, uh, it will continue at the moment with a capped list um, the same as Moatfield which sort of helps a bit to uh, control the list but it means that all the all the pressure won't be going on the surrounding practices which wasn't felt to be a tenable position um, but as a caveat to that decision Amy uh, did say that uh, her next move was actually to to convene a meeting and there would as an invite you to be going out in the next uh, week I think um, convene a meeting between all the providers so that would be between the two practices the GP Federation um, QVH to actually discuss if there is uh, what can be done in the short term uh, to meet the access uh, uh, challenges across the area if that's considered sort of in the round. Um, so I know that there are, there are discussions uh, happening already locally um, so we're sort of offering to come and, and help perhaps to facilitate some of those early discussions if that is what is wanted. In uh, Dr Patel because clearly you know, he's been, uh, thank you for saying the, the latest update. Um, so I'd, I'd like to uh, offer the opportunity to Dr. Patel first and then maybe James to comment on what you've just said, uh, particularly, you know, about 
the effects of other providers um, with the the, with the challenges, as you, as you say, mm. Dr. Patel? Um, well, I mean, I think it's safe to say we, we sort of agree, I agree with everything that Karen, Karen has said so far. You know, no, I, I have this saying that no tax is more than one or two resignations away mm -hmm. from disaster, and that's probably true in many ways. Uh, and, you know, we, I wouldn't exactly say that we are a shining beacon of, you know, perfect access. We certainly aren't, you know. Um, Currently, uh, you know, if we were to look at how much demand we actually meet, if you, if you think about the number of people who phone us on a daily basis and the actual number of people we might be able to, to help and not signpost elsewhere, it's about 60%. Uh, and, and that's a practice that's performing quite well. So um, our certainly our list size has grown uh, quite considerably especially between May and August this year, and it's continuing to build. And uh, what we're seeing is quite a, a, a uh, currently registered at modality. Uh, our issue, and th thanks to the ICB in actual fact for not enabling um, modality to close their, their list, but what we're finding is that rather than having an average population re-registering with us on modality, we're getting ultra complex older people registering with us so that's creating an inordinate additional pressure uh, because often people have not had uh, their needs attended to for quite a long time so that's not easy for us to manage and uh, you know we are, we are relatively speaking a smaller practice although uh, our and it is very stable and you know we are pretty much at sort of establishment our main issue is space uh and finances that's it's as simple as that uh resources are getting tighter because of underfunded um above inflation pay rises and the general effect of inflation <laughs> from I just feel uh but you know primary care budgets are under you know extreme pressure uh, and they're actually getting smaller, not bigger, relatively speaking. So, you know, it's not, it's it's the toughest time I've seen in general practice in my 24.75 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so, so, so it, is, it is getting very difficult. And the only way forward is to navigate with other, other providers around us. Um, I mean, in terms of, in terms of the current uh, plans, I, I would hope that the system finds a way of thinking about long-term sustainable plans rather than short-term access fixes. <coughs> access is really important, I, and we all understand that. You know, it's the first port of call to, to, to a whole variety of services potentially. Um, but and, and I have worked with other uh, practices who are struggling in other parts of the country. I've done a lot of work uh, in, in other places and you know, believe you me, this is not a six month job. It's a three year, um, you know, uh, you know, development because it takes a long time to build a functioning, confident, effective team that <coughs> works together well and sustain. Sustaining a team like that takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of resources. It doesn't happen magically. Um, so, you know, modality, it'll take them quite a long time to get to that place. Mm -hmm. And the short-term fixes have to result <coughs> in something that's more long-term. Can't be a series of short-term fixes. Um, and, and that would be my plea, really. Okay, thank you, James. Any comments you'd like to make? And they need to be shared data to get the data for the data center. We get the best ones they all look at those large population. And if we what we think that they need what we've got to help them assess the threat and provide quick collaborative services for that population, and of course we can find what we need. That's why we suppose the community teams come in really important for the best ones, make sure they're enjoying the services we don't get from the best ever into this piece for them, which show them we're going to be showing them with um locally. That collaborative approach, I'll be there from Owen's approach to bring us around the table to make us see that. Thanks for taking that. The social tenants are part of it, we've already spoken about. 
you know, all the premises for patient trials are so important. So that is a really important part of our social strength now, which will start to make a real difference to local populations in the medium term and to what's going to make a real change. Okay, thank you. Can I just, um, I'd, I'd like to meet, time is moving on, need to wrap up. So Karen, just coming back on this meeting, I would say that Amy Galea attended, as you will know, uh, a, an excellent public meeting at the Haven Centre in Crawley Down on the 13th of October, uh, <coughs> chaired um, by Jeremy Quinn. But Amy, in particular, I thought was was very very good. Uh, didn't pull any punches. So, um, will she be arranging and chairing this meeting, as you say? And will this meeting happen before Christmas? Uh, uh, just to confirm the meeting Karen hopefully yeah yeah Amy is intending to be um, at that meeting and um, the 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 uh, yes we're trying to get it in before Christmas we're trying to get it sort of the next two or three weeks but um, as, as you can imagine uh, trying to coordinate diaries from extremely busy clinicians and then across the system is 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 can be tricky but that that's the aim is to if for it to be before christmas and with amy chairing i think we've got two very very willing yeah. or three very very willing they're all nodding and uh, saying they've got their diaries out karen so i'll leave that to you tomorrow yeah. uh, can i is it from me and this town council you know clearly it's been a great session this evening i do want i do need to move on i mean you know so it's, it's been a long evening and you guys are busy enough so um, if, if we could just leave this by saying, please have the meeting. Dr. Allen. Please, please do. Um, I'm also with, with another hat on chair of the British Legion locally. So <coughs> okay. So, um, Council <laughs> yeah. uh, So Penny and Karen on Zoom, thank you so much for your time. We're really grateful as always. Uh, Manesh and Deborah, thank you again, um, and for everything you do in this council. We're very grateful. Okay, thank you. And thank James, you. thank you very much. James, for thanks again. Coming in again. Okay, thank you very much, thank guys. You. Please keep the dialogue going. We hugely appreciate it. Um, and uh, it's a, we've never had so many experts in the room, so thank you for that. Thank you. Bye bye. Please do feel free to leave the Zoom room. That, that thank you very much. No, that's thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So, moving on, um, apologies for the extended discussions uh, to uh, Mike Barlow and Mike Brooks. Um, so, uh, thank you for being very patient. The, the table and floor is yours, gentlemen, for East Grinstead Food Bank. <coughs> okay, um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going to that was an eye you might want to sit here yeah. just to speak in there. Yeah, sorry. Just a bit. <laughs> I think that, that, that visit <coughs> was probably the, uh, the catalyst that ended up in an invite to well, I know that our town mayor have visited you and the leader I think visited yes. and uh, and I followed on from that so yeah yeah um thank you um what do we do as the British Food Bank I, I, I do a quick um, background um we support local individuals that can't put food on the table um whether that's um for short or long-term reasons um both families are in crisis and, and that's the crisis. Um, where they are referred to us by local agencies. Um, and we also try, uh, as, as a part of that process, we try to understand their situation. Um, and we refer out and signpost out to other agencies, such as housing departments, charities such as Fernie Help, community fridges, church cafes, baby banks, hope, hope job club, planning guides. It, it, um, we signpost into a network of other charities and agencies such as Citizens Advice, I'll get onto that in a moment, and CAP, um, to support them through any crisis that they're, they're, they're uh, experiencing. We started just over 10 years ago in a garage um, 
and we've grown steadily since, unfortunately. Um, it's my job to try and make myself redundant. I'm failing miserably. Um, in our first year of operation, we fed 823 people. Last year, we fed 2,612. And during the pandemic year, which is when I took over in April of that year, we fed 2,738 people. Um, and we're, we're just tracking that. Um, pretty much. We're a Trussell Trust franchise food bank, and I, I'll explain that. We operate under the Trussell Trust guidelines and principles, and we, but we stand as, a, as a, an independent charity in our own right. So if we ended the franchise, we'd still be a food bank and a charity. Uh, we're open to clients three times a day, uh, on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, um, and we currently see about 20 to 30 clients each session. So we're seeing about 200 to 250 people per month. Um, and the in-between days, the Tuesdays and the Thursdays, Mike and his team, who Mike is our warehouse manager, um, his team look after the warehouse and make sure that the food that we've got are, is in date, it's properly stored, it's properly looked after. We are governed by the guidelines that every supermarket is covered mm -hmm. by. We have a food hygiene rating. We have mm -hmm. sudden unannounced inspections, and we've not dropped below five stars so um, since that's since we started. Um, as I said, our clients are referred to us by external agencies such as social workers, support workers, mental health work teams, GP surgeries like Moatfield. Moatfield is one of the biggest referrers of from surgery in the town. Um, debt advice services, churches, schools, schools, fantastic resource for referrals because they know the families, they know the background, and they actually can spot a, a family in crisis and, and can suggest that they come to us. <clears throat> and during the pandemic, we switched to a digital e voucher system. Um, we used to have these red bits of paper that people had to hand around to each other, which was a bit of an infection vector. <laughs> so we switched to the digital e voucher system that Trussell Trust in, uh, came up with. And we were one of the first adopters of that um, in the system. Um, we, get, we get digital notifications of each voucher that's issued to us. So we get the contact details, the details of the client, so that we can then phone them. Um, and that during the pandemic was was really helpful because we could have teams at home working from home, and we could digitally send picking lists and details <coughs> and notes and stuff between us and back and forth to the warehouse. Our warehouse is based at Jubilee Community Centre, and as is our reception area, um, and we've been there for about eight years now. So we're very very well supported by the Jubilee Community Centre. Um, it's a fantastic resource and it's a fantastic building for the town. Um, many of our clients are struggling with short and long term circumstances, including health issues. The doctors didn't say in the, in the, in the room, but um, both, they're, they're both chronic and short term physical, mental dependency issues and debt. And a lot of that, very often, we found it, we're finding these days is that that debt goes hand in hand with a mental health issue. And we're sometimes struggling to, to know whether we solve the debt, the health issue, the mental health issue or the debt issue. And usually it's, we have to try and find a way of helping that mental health issue before we can even start on the debt. And debt has become, uh, in recent years, obviously for, for many reasons that you're, all, I'm sure you're all aware of, is um, it's become a significant issue. Increased rents, energy, food costs, the cost of living crisis, as, as it's being called now. Um, we also have emergency food parcels available. We supply, for instance, um, the probation office in Crawley, um, a, a supply of emergency food boxes to people leaving prison to give them something to, to spend. They, they get very little when they leave prison. Um, we also keep a stock of um, emergency out of hours, family emergency boxes, single emergency boxes. We keep SIM cards, we keep kettles, we keep toasters, cutlery, crockery, um, can openers, and microwaves. We keep 
the small electrical items in stock. We try to um, because they're often we're often asked to supply those in an emergency situation. Somebody has been moved to the town um, overnight with nothing, no bedding, no bed sometimes, no cooking facilities, nothing. They're given a key to a room and said, you know, so they come to us. We're, we're often the first port of call. 99% of our food, the food that we hand out is donated by the buying public in the stores, in the supermarkets, in Sainsbury's, Sainsbury's is our largest donation point, but <coughs> JCC come a, a very close second, followed by Waitrose. Um, and that they're key. So, so um, and to that effect, we, we, we are really concentrating on, I'm going to push it, we have a, a, an app that we use now that we've adopted, um, and it's a, a nationwide app, free app, you can download to your phone, and it gives you an up to the minute, minute our, our list of needs that we need. That, 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 and the, the problem is, and I'll come to this moment, is, is that we need to really concentrate on what food we're getting in from those people. Um, so, um, since the cost of living crisis, the food that ha is being donated is going down and the demand is going up. And we're currently giving out more food than we're getting in. And that's mm. not sustainable. Um, we are seriously looking at sometime next year having to buy food, as is many of the food banks around this area. And surrounding us, um, one food bank on the south coast is currently spending between 10 and 15,000 pounds a week buying food. It's scary. <laughs> um, and so that's that's why we're concentrating on the app. And I think that's probably held us up. We have the third largest sign up in the country for this app just in this town. What's, what's the app called? It's called the app, the app called Bank of Food. Bank of Food. Yeah. Um, and I, I will, I will talk to you. I'll send you my report. It's got links to that if you want it. Um, and um, we can supply it. QR codes, etc., and I've got leaflets here with details of it in there. Bank of food is 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 usable by every food bank, not just ours. We've got a new postcode, and it, you can select ours, our food bank, and we are targeting the food that we actually need on our picking list. Not very rarely beans, pasta, or soup. <laughs> very rarely, very 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 rarely, um, but that's what we tend to get in. And that's what we were trying not to get in. We do so much more than that, more than food. We do sanitary items, nappies. We do, um, you know, personal hygiene items. We do cleaning items. We do, um, what else, Mike? Um, this, um, it, 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 the list goes on and on and on. Um, and it, it, it's just, you know, toilet rolls, baby lotions, baby wipes. Just loads of things that we, we do that you wouldn't think of that people need and, and they need it. Um, so bank of food is, is our key at the moment, and that's that's holding us away from buying that food. The only thing we do buy at the moment is bread because it gets crushed in the bottom of the collection boxes. Um, so we have over about over a, I think it's 1100 people signed up to bank of food at the town at the moment. 1,074, almost 1100. Yeah. And, and that is, I mean, that's remarkable. And um, we're, we're sort of, you know, we've been contacted by the app uh, providers saying, this, how are you doing this? <laughs> so we're very, very proud of the fact that we've managed to get so many people interested in food bank and, and signed up to this. Um, in 2021, we signed a new franchise agreement with the Trussell Trust, and that is that we demonstrate that we are not provide, we are not, we are we are working towards people not needing us as a food bank. It's no good giving out the food is the easy bit. We mm -hmm. need to take on the difficult bit, which is to help people not need us, and that means tackling their debt, tackling their housing issues, tackling their support issues tackling so much more behind that just I need to eat. Um, so to that end, we got, um, with the help of the Trussell Trust, a three-year grant, which is a very generous grant, 
to provide citizens advice, advisors to work exclusively with us in the food bank every week. Um, and that, that advice comes in twice a week and uh, we're working with them um, to, and, and that's where we're finding out that this mental health issue and this debt issue is, is linked very, 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 very closely. In addition to that, we signpost people, um, we, we work very closely with the East Grinstead Lions. Um, they're fantastic in providing uh, support for people with um, debit accounts for energy. We, op we, we formed a, an alliance with the um, Fuel Bank Foundation for people who have prepayment meters. Uh, so we can top up prepayment meters and the Lions can do with debit accounts. Um, and they're fantastic. We just email them the, 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 the details of the people that need to top up and they do it. So it's great. And we can do ours via a laptop. Um, and we work with we work with turning tides for, for people that sleep rough. Um, we have access to their outreach workers um, so that we can contact them and get them to go and find these people. We also started working on a non-cash basis with local stores providing fixed value redeemable vouchers, which is something that we produce ourselves. They are security, securitized, to use an American term. Um, well, we, 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 sent, we give out vouchers for stone butchers. We give out vouchers for West Street laundrette so that people can clean their clothes. That it's especially street sleepers, they need to, you know, Get their, they get their clothes washed. JP Food can provide a shower. Um, we haven't yet managed to wangle a big, a big washing machine in the building yet. Um, I'm working on a southeast water for that, <laughs> but it's taken a long time. Uh, we're currently about to bring online a British Heart Foundation um, voucher so that people can take that and go to the British Heart Foundation store and pick up, you know, um, albeit secondhand food. Um, and hopefully, in uh, sorry second-hand clothes or, or items. Uh, we're hoping to get back a fresh fruit and vegetable um, voucher uh, system, but that fell by the wayside when uh, our, our, re our, our previous supplier didn't work out. It, um, so we're hoping to get that coming back online. We pay for that from our fund. All of those vouchers are paid for. Um, we are about to start working with Mid Sussex District Council housing team. Um, uh, they will be doing a drop in session on Mondays in our food bank to help people with housing issues. Anybody that's getting close to being homeless, being evicted, they are the, they, they are the place to go. Um, we've been working with our own. Um, on full at uh, Mid Sussex District Council on that, and that's due to come online very shortly. It might <coughs> might go into the new year. We're not sure, but that's that's that is really good. We're we're really keen on that. What's next? Uh, we're keen to set up a cost of living group um, in collaboration with other interested groups in the town. Um, what what our it, it, it's a supporting aim. Um, Trotter Trust have a, um, um, a guarantee our um, essentials campaign, which is effectively it's the, the fact is that universal credit doesn't meet the essentials that anybody needs to live. It's about £35 short. And actually, if you tot up what we give out as a food bank to people, it's about £35 worth of food. And, and that's what, so we're becoming by de facto. A, a de facto part of the benefit system is becoming is it, we're becoming embedded and that's that's something we need to work work against we, we we want to try and get people not to need us as i said before so other troops like trust and trust food banks begun setting up these these cost of living groups um one has even got a contract with their local council um, to jointly work to manage local count cost of living problem um, and the aims that we would we would hope to, to, <coughs> to tackle are to provide best coordinated support for the cost of living crisis provide specific resources for help um, from diverse agencies to provide all sorts of 
of, of support, um, coordinated access to funds, and, and that's where you guys come in if, if that's something you can help with, really, is knowing where, where those funds are, what those resources are. And also, we, we, we have been hunting down um, household support funds. We've managed to get a payment for a household support fund um, towards working the part of the cost of living um, group would be to provide white foods. Very often we have people coming into, our, our clients are coming into the food bank, their cooker's broken. They buy a cooker they can't afford to eat. The fridge freezer's broken. It's broken and they've lost all the food from the fridge freezer. It's gone. Um, it, it's those kind of things. That the car breaks down and, and, and they can't get to work. So those are the sorts of things that we'd like to tackle. Can, um, I, can I just yes. interject? I know I'm, I'm no, sorry. Sorry. no, 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 I'm good to start, but, but just on that particular point, whilst it, we can just wrap up, we've, we've got a couple of other agenda items just to sure. squeeze in. Sure. Councillor Gibson here, if you don't know, is not just town, but mid okay. Sussex district and oh, the county okay. council. Yeah. So I would say, not put him, Johnny, on the spot, but he's <laughs> your main contact for the things that you've been saying, potentially initiatives. You've already mentioned mid Sussex and the housing. Yeah. And Councillor Gibson is integrally involved in that. Uh, so I don't want to necessarily <laughs> prolong the discussion, but for your information. Sure. No, that's, please, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. I'm just been the leader of the council. Okay, so while we're on that subject, thank you. Um, and I've taken lots of your notes because I have I a dual hat that, um, um, in, in my full time job, which I'll, I'll talk to you about afterwards. But the small items you talk about, the small electrical and everything, yeah. can they be donated? Yeah. Um, you, they can. Been I was going to say because the pat yeah. testing is the thing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Normally we. So we do you have a pat tester or, or? We have a pat tester. Well, we have actually <coughs> one. Mike's our pat tester. Mm -hmm. He's got two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And we also work being neighbourly, and they've just got pat testing. Yeah. yeah. As well, okay. So. okay. Cool. Councillor Gibson, uh, before we wrap this particular. Yeah. No, I was going to point me. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. right. um, you know, sort of. A, I mean, I knew that we were trying to pick out the uh, support phase for the housing support fund. Yes. But the yeah. point that I wanted HSS to make is that um, I've been somewhat shocked <coughs> to discover that when we put people into bed and breakfast, so we get, I mean, we are seeing an explosion of people, or all councils are, you know, becoming homeless through mm -hmm. no fault of their own. When we put a family into bed and breakfast, actually, our sector of requirement is only the B. Right? Mm -hmm. And we are directing those the, you know those families to go and visit the food bank mm. to do exactly that, and it's like I said, if you're in a if you're in a travel lodge and there's a kettle, all you can do is, is pot noodles. Yeah, and, and, like that. and, and it's really mm -hmm. I was just just to ask you, are you seeing that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. that and, and yeah, I mean we, I mean we are better than I think almost all the other councils. I mean certainly those which are going okay. bankrupt. But thank you for that. So <laughs> you've got a primary contact here. Um, mm. Mm. I, I I would say that yeah, if you could, I mean, fantastic um, presentation, all of those, very innovative, you know, because one other yeah, go on. I could very very quickly yeah. bring in is not only the cost of living group, but what we would like to do with with help is to reintroduce a community bank into our town. Yeah. We have been in talks with Boom Bank in Worthing, which is a community bank. Just a little tiny bit of history is that we used to have a community bank in this town. It, is. it went to Crawley. It then got amalgamated into Worthing, which is where Boom Bank is. And that many of the people that were saving in East Winter Community Bank are still savers with Boom Bank. They got shifted. We have been talking to Boom Bank. They want to be in the town again, and we are helping them as a representative of <coughs> within the town. Um, and and we'd like to take that further. They would like to present to the town council. Okay, they, well, we'll, we'll take that and lots of other points on Thank through you. that. Mm -hmm. And in the town council's related groups, I mean, we've got local business association, lots of other sure. groups that are yeah, linked yeah. into the town council. Yeah. Um, we we just, as I said before, this this committee and this town council are facilitators. We'll try and facilitate. So. Mm -hmm. If you could do a, a, a bullet point summary to it, obviously, sure. she's been typing all the while. So she's, oh, she's got all of this, I know, but 
but just a, as, a, as an issued document. I'm sorry, I have got the report now. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> um, Thank you. And, and we'll, yeah, I mean, and we'll hopefully Thank you. We'll see you again in, in the new year for, for updates on all of this sort of stuff. If I could ask Councillor Reeves just to. Mike so. and Mike, thank you so much for your time and your wonderful service. Well, all of the SD districts and the community for Thank you for your time and look forward to hearing from you in the new year. Yeah. Um, my, my contact details are on here, so if you. Yeah. I've downloaded the app already. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you, Rick. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, it automatically activates. <laughs> it will ping you just before you go into yeah. the front door. Oh, my well, list as I go in. Yeah, and then we'll also tell you where you were. We can also send you a SMS message. If you want some help, Mike can help you. It can send you an SMS message okay, once thank, a week. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, just moving on very quickly. Alice, I'm really, really sorry about Thank you very much. Incredibly patient. Right. If you'd like to just, we've obviously got your detailed report once again. Mm -hmm. Pick out the high, the salient highlight points. Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting session. Um, so, perhaps rather than me going through the report, I'll just ask a couple of questions. Yeah, as we've got um, uh, uh, a joint member of the Speed Watch group here, the, the polls um, yeah, for the SIG. I can go through the SIG bit, but there's a, a very communicated report. <coughs> oh, yeah. On that section of no, I don't no. think so. Thank you. 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 The only, the only thing I've got to be clear about is that it is definitely a town council event. Yeah. If it's a town okay. council Sorry. event, we don't let's, know. That's fine. Let's we do a resolution, resolution just in case. <coughs> there are any financial implications on that. Um, can we resolve to uh, approve that this evening to pass on to F and GP? Is that mm -hmm. how it goes? Yes. I, I, okay. I think Alice is right, but if we can right. just make the resolution, so it's good. Vote. <laughs> I said that's all backed up. I wish to fail. Oh, that's fine. That's Thank you. That's resolved. Always a technical solution to be found. <laughs> Just find it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any questions for? Yeah, Councillor Hughes. Yeah. So thank you for the report. Just a question about the um, the line which is about the intention to place the sea between three and six months and then move them on. Intent of rotation. And I do <coughs> wondered whether we looked at any research uh, that had been done about the optimum time for digs. Um, and I did do a little bit of research. I found a couple of reports from people sort of saying three weeks feels optimum, and then you get a big lag effect. So yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one. There is there is a little bit of, of perhaps a hearsay report rather than specific evidence saying that <coughs> people get sign blindness yeah. and um, it's not that useful after a period mm -hmm. of time. But ours is a special sig in that they're recording the data. So three weeks of data isn't a huge amount. But mm -hmm. what we've been doing so far of, of all the data that we've gotten is mm -hmm. we've been doing eight to 12 weeks at each site to get a solid amount of data, um, mm -hmm. which is then helping us to decide where we want to have our sigs placed. So I guess there's a balance between... And I think that's, that's part, part of it, because the purpose of the SID in the longer term is to establish whether there's a need for additional um, sort of 
intervention and um, speed reduction um, uh, implementation there. Um, so just only having two or three weeks is not going to give us that information. What we have also found is once we, because uh, uh, our friends on Speedwatch did say that actually three weeks is probably all you should be looking at doing, um, but we need to get this data to be able to pass it to mm -hmm. the police and pass it to the county with regards mm -hmm. to being able to look at uh, more permanent solutions as to what it would be. We also find the second we move it out, we're then getting asked to put it back. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. so again, we need to have that evidence to be able to say, I'm very sorry, there isn't the evidence that people are speeding down this road or mm. it's come to the point that actually we're now able to say it is significant and we need to look now at the next solution as well. So that's why we're looking at longer. slightly longer than perhaps uh, would, that would be mm. felt to be optimum. We're trying to use this as a tool mm. to move the whole thing. Oh, Councillor Barnett, yeah. Sorry. Also, after it's um, quite delicate and moving them every three weeks is not ideal for the maintenance. Very true. Good point. Good point. Mm. Councillor Barnett, Um. I know we've had a, <clears throat> a conversation maybe outside of this outside of this room, but but um an update please on, on the, the nature of the SIDS that we're going to get because um I'm still concerned if, if we get non-recording SIDS for ones that don't sort of um, give any information on uh, that. On, just... uh, yeah. <clears throat> on um the you know, registration numbers then then we are uh, not um, looking forward far enough of, of how we tell us. Would you like to just comment on that? Point? It's not exclusive in those cases, but we cannot <coughs> um, kids that record that ain't any of mm -hmm. that record them on the plates because it's not in our remit to be um, sending fines and, and things to people that have recruited them yet. Um, so we can't have those kids. We did look into the Sussex Police. Following different rules to Suffolk Police, then the Suffolk Police do indeed do that. Okay. We, we so it's not a national We can only rules. assume yes. We can only assume you're actually right, Councillor. But um, we've discussed this specifically with Sussex Police following you raising mm -hmm. it, and that's the answer we've had back yeah. is that Sussex okay. Police I, will not support it. Can we can I just ask? We'll double check your point, Councillor Barnett. <coughs> if you've got evidence of Sussex, Suffolk Police doing that, and we'll relay that information. And we'll double ask and double check. Okay. 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 We've got it in to double check. Yeah. It? So, okay. Uh, can I also just say the SIDS has been bought? Yeah, we've got Yeah, we've got the SIDS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've, we've got what we, we are where we are. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alice, for another fantastic report. Um, moving on to your general item 11, amenity tip. Um, you've seen that. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like we're going to an on <coughs> Councillor Gibson, has that decision been made now? No, it isn't. Uh, not at the moment. Um, I'd just like some guidance as to whether or not everybody would like me to try and resist it. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I think, having, having seen it when, when he lives in Suff <laughs> Suffolk, I mean, my, my observation is it works well <coughs> at the Horsham tip because the Horsham tip is a <coughs> terribly badly organised tip. Yeah. Our tip is very well run, it's well a new run. facility. Yeah. There are no queues anytime, so we don't need it. That's my personal view. Lynn. I concur, Chair. I think that the road we have for our amenities and our recycling centre, because it is now a recycling centre of, of, of um, good standing, yeah. we have that yeah. long road yeah. going in, so yeah. there isn't the queues yeah. and the need for it like there has been yeah. in other situations. Cool. And other things. Just to explain that the, if you notice the way it was phrased, is that the cabinet member has the right to individually impose it. Mm. which would require her to issue a decision in order to do that. Mm. But she's chosen to make it part of the budget discussion. So it's shown as a budget re reduction. So that leaves open the possibility to charge, to, to challenge the county council budget okay. in order to get that removed. And there is no evidence. She lacks evidence, but I, I might put okay. some questions. For the sake of clarity around this meeting, um, can we have a, 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 a vote to say who would like to keep the current system as it is? Rather than an online system for the tip. All councillors, councillor Elsie. Yeah. So that, that's, you know, yeah, so that, does that give you an answer? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So okay. um, Thank you. Got some sort of mandate right. for going. Thank you for that. Uh, and the, the final agenda item is just for noting it's the Southern Water Clean Season Rivers plans, which kicks in in 2025. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Else. <laughs> so, um, uh, if anybody's, that's, that's, that's for noting. 
and we are bang on nine o'clock. So thank, thank you again for all your patience. <coughs> We've got a substantive meeting. We'll cover everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sam, for your copious notes. <laughs> thank you, thank you guys for your patience You're and uh, and everybody for attending. And um, I close this meeting at exactly nine o'clock. <laughs> Have a lovely Enjoy. Christmas and see you in the new year. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. <laughs>